us on the claim to do. Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He answered them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then you will stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you, and you will say, We ate and drank in your company and you taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and will recline a table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Lord. Well, Lord Jesus in the Gospel today deals quite in a cagey kind of way with his disciples, doesn't he? They ask the question about how many are going to make it into heaven? And he never answers their question, does he? Instead, he goes into this length, rather lengthy discussion about who is going to make it and who is not going to make it? He describes the characteristics of each group. Not how many, but what's it going to be like to make the cut or not make the cut. Isaiah begins. He talks, look at all the nations where my people are. From that group, my brothers and sisters will be called forth. Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, does the same. Paul, I always say Paul, we're not exactly sure that Paul wrote the letter of Hebrews, but that's a, a slip. Right, so the author of the letter of the Hebrews, whoever it was, probably a disciple Paul, takes, uses the same theme. He speaks to us, the disciples, as sons and daughters, as children of God Most High. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because let's face it, if you are the children of the master of the household, you won't be knocking from the outside in the middle of the night saying, Lord, open the door for us. You'd already be in bed on the inside. You would have to be asking to get in at the last minute because you're part, as we would say in my Italian part of Brooklyn, you're part of the family. All righty? You'd be already in. And therein, my brothers and sisters, is the key. The nobility that God the Heavenly Father bestows on us and he allows us to call him Father. And he makes us his sons and daughters. On the day of our baptism, on the day of our baptism, you are anointed with sacred chrism on the crown of your head. Why? Because if your father was a king in this world, you have a golden crown placed on the crown of your head. Your father is the king of the universe. Each of you becomes a prince or a princess on the day of your baptism as he anoints you and adopts you with the sacred chrism of his name, named after the son, on the crown of your head. You're all nobility, your highnesses. <laughs> Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> but that's who we are. And folks, that has tremendous consequences when we remember who we are. Because to the Jews, to call God Father, they would say, boy, you Catholics, you've got some put stop. <laughs> to the Muslims, they would say it's blasphemy to call. They have 99 names for God. Father is one of them. And look at their posture, my brothers and sisters. When they pray, how do they pray? They put their head to the ground. We don't. 
When we pray, it is, and our prayer at the Mass is the best and highest form of a prayer, it is right. It is right and good for you to kneel during the Eucharistic prayer. When the bread and wine ceases to be and becomes, through the sacrament of Holy Orders and the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, the living and real presence of Christ coming to us in the disguise of bread and wine on our altar. It is right to kneel. But as soon as the Eucharistic prayer is finished and we sing the great Amen, and before we say, Our Father, what do you do? Stand. Because what father would have his children grovel before him to ask for the daily bread and the things he knows they need and that he longs to give them just as soon as he hears their prayer making that request? The posture that we use for prayer bespeaks the different relationships that the Jew, the Muslim, and the Catholic have in relationship to them. Because ours is a loving Father who only wants us to love Him like sons and daughters. And on our baptismal day, my brothers and sisters, we were made just that. A suggestion to you. If you don't know the day of your baptism, look it up. Today, is the day of my baptism. I was born on July 30th, and three and a half weeks later, my folks brought me to our parish church where I was baptized, made my first Holy Communion, was confirmed, and celebrated my first Mass as a priest. Look up the day of your baptism and treasure that day. Celebrate that day. Not just your birthday. Birthdays are fine. But your baptismal day is the day where you became a prince or a princess. Live 